Hi, welcome. I'm Pastor Darrell, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of New Glarus Bible Church in the beautiful city of New Glarus, Wisconsin. And I want to welcome you to our online service. Uh, we're glad that you're visiting with us today, and I'm hoping that you will be blessed. Uh, currently, we're uh, walking through the Gospel of Matthew. We're doing it chapter by chapter, section by section, and at times, verse by verse. Uh, here at New Glarus Bible Church, we have a passion for God's Word, and we believe that it truly transforms lives. If you're ever in the New Glarus area, we welcome you to join us for a Sunday morning worship service, and I promise that you will be warmly welcome. And once again, thanks for visiting us online and I'm hoping that you'll be encouraged. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things he knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. You are not a God created by human. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another beautiful day. Uh, we thank you for a beautiful air-conditioned building to come in and worship you. Uh, I pray that you and allow us to uh, focus in on the words that we sing. 
Pray that you would enable us to focus in on the message that's being spoken today as we look into your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we leave here today, that our lives will be transformed. We'll look a little bit more like Jesus. And I pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. to God in prayer. 
You'd uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and I uh, want to thank the Schindlers for being with us today, and what an honor it is to have um, members of the family that uh, helped to start the church, and, and it must be a blessing to see that the church continues, and it's continuing on. So uh, I want to let you know that what we do here at New Glarus Bible Church is we walk through the Bible. We've been walking through Matthew since January. And our goal is to come to know the biblical Jesus, not a cultural Jesus. And our goal is to uh, get to know our Bibles better. And uh, today we're going to be talking about understanding prayer. I've entitled the message Prayer 101. And um, so we're not going to be diving deep into all the intricacies of, of prayer. But we are going to be talking about issues that spring from the text that's before us today. I, I grew up in a, a parochial uh, school. I, I went to parochial school through sixth grade, and it was a Catholic parochial school. Uh, it was either once a week or once a month they would have confession. And so we would walk across the street from the school to the church, and uh, they had two confessional boxes there. Uh, here's where the priests would sit, and they'd have a, a booth where a student would go, and then another booth. They had a confessional booth, and so you could be kind of rotating the students as they do their confession time. And I, and I remember going in there and saying, uh, this is what we would always say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been one week since my last confession. And then what you would do is you would make up sins that you committed. I lied four times, and I did this, and... And they would give you four Hail Marys and five Our, Our Fathers to pray. And then immediately what we would do as students, we would go out and we would pray Our, Our Fathers as quick as we could and Our Hail Marys as quick as we could so that we could get out to recess. Okay, back at that point in my life, prayer didn't mean much. Uh, I became a Christian on February 8th, 1981. I, I was born again. I became a child of God, and immediately I began to pray. I, I had a very fervent prayer um, life. I, I was in constant communication with my Heavenly Father. The difference was is that I was born again, I became a child of God, and I had a desire to communicate with my Heavenly Father. You know, unfortunately, as we grow older as Christians, we need to be reminded to communicate with our Heavenly Father with the same frequency and the same intimacy. And, and today, that's what we're going to be doing today, is I'm, I'm hoping to encourage you in your prayer life. That's my goal today. Uh, there are times when we are so busy that, that we forget to pray. Isn't that right? And, and there are times when we are so confident in our abilities, we don't feel a need to pray. And then there's other times where we feel so unworthy as if we cannot pray. There are other times when we have more exciting things to do than pray. And there are times when we have questions about prayer. Why pray? Does it work at all? And so there's many reasons that keep us from wanting to pray the way that God desires for us to pray. Because basically what prayer is, is us communicating with God. And then responding by, by going into his words, into his word. And that's how we, he communicates back with us. And so today, that's my goal, is, is to, you know, help us to be, have a, a little greater understanding and then a, a greater desire to pray. 
Um, life's greatest battles are won when we pray. And, and so I want to explain prayer to the best of my ability, but I assure you that I am not quite the prayer warrior that I would want to be or ought to be. Uh, I think one of the most humbling questions that you can ask a pastor or a fellow Christian is, how's your prayer life? It's, it's an area that many of us really, really stumble in. But when we look at the Bible, what we see is that there are over 650 different prayers. We find prayers all the way back in the book of Genesis, all the way through the book of Revelation. And God loves our prayers and he desires for us to communicate with him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read our text here in a moment and then I'm going to pray. But before I read the text, I want you to notice some things. We started out last week with verse 1, chapter 6. Jesus said, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then what he does is he goes and he talks about three different acts of righteousness. Last week we talked about the act of righteousness of giving. This week we're going to talk about the act of righteousness called prayer. And in a couple of weeks we're going to talk about the act of righteousness called fasting. So in, in verse 2, we see giving. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Today in verse 5, and when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. And then in verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. And so in all of these, what Jesus is assuming that we would do as, as Christians, followers of Christ, is that we would fast and that we would give and that we would pray. But he's warning us that there's a danger that we would do these acts of righteousness for the wrong reasons. So let's, let's read our text in verse 5. Jesus says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. My goal and intention is to um, help us to greater understand this mystery of prayer and also, Lord, to encourage us to pray. Because you, our Heavenly Father, desire to hear the request of our hearts. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I have six things I want to show you today when we talk about the, the when and the how and the where and the why of prayer. Um, let me turn on my PowerPoint here. The first one is, I want to show you the perplexities of prayer. In other words, uh, the intricacies, the, uh, the, the complexities of prayer. Uh, it, we, we wonder, how does this prayer thing work? You know, is it like we pray and then God immediately answers? Is that, is that how that works? You know, what are the conditions on prayer? And there are some who have approached prayer a little bit different than others. There are some who believe very fully in the sovereignty of God. And when I say the sovereignty of God, what I mean by that is that God says in his words that, that in his word that there are certain things that he will do and they cannot be thwarted. Uh, well, since that is true, then why pray? You know, God's going to do it. Why do I need to pray? It's going to come about anyway. That's one of the, the complexities of prayer. Uh, um, is my prayer going to change what God is going to do? Not if I believe in the sovereignty of God. And so a person coming from that perspective um, prays more to get in line with what God is doing in the world. 
There are other people who approach the Bible with more of free will of man emphasis. And their prayer, uh, perspective of prayer is this. We pray to move the heart of God so that he might answer our prayer. So one is focusing in on the heart of God and the other one is focusing in on the heart of man. If God is going to do it, why pray? The reason that we pray even though we might not be able to figure this out, and I won't be able to explain this today, the reason that we pray is because God has called us to pray. And he says very explicitly in this passage, when you pray. He is assuming that we are going to pray. So there, there, there's this mystery that, that is very difficult for us to solve. And so the best thing that we can do is just be obedient and come to God our Father and pray. One person said this, The greatest of men could never resolve the divine mystery of how a human prayer moves an omnipotent divine arm. So, what God wants us to do is to come to him and pray. The next thing I would want to show you today is the priority of prayer. The priority of prayer. It says in our passage that when you pray, it says that when you pray, that you're to pray with a, a heart that wants to communicate with God. You're not to be reading a script. So a, a question for you is, when do you most pray? When is prayer the most, or scheduled the highest in your priority list? Uh, more than likely, you would tell me that um, you pray when things are hard. Um, some people say that there are no atheists in foxholes. And I believe that's true. I believe that even those who are declared atheists, when their lives are really online, they spontaneously and involuntarily, they pray. They will utter the name of God. They will call out to God. Uh, other people say that as long as there are, <clears throat> are tests in school, there will be prayer in school. You can outlaw it, but I tell you what, the students are going to be praying when things get hard. But when do, you, when do you pray the most? And when does prayer become a priority in your life? In, in James, it says this, If any among you is in trouble, let them pray. If anyone is happy, let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. So in other words, we're to make a priority of prayer when we're going through difficult times and also when we're going through good times. Prayer is always to be a priority. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said this, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go, my own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. We're driven to prayer when we're going through heavenly or going through really difficult times. I want to I want to tell you seven different kinds of prayers. We'll walk through this pretty quickly, but seven different kinds of prayers that we ought to make a priority. And these prayers all come from our heart. Uh, the first one I, I want to call prayers of surrender. Prayers of surrender. When, when we are going through a difficult time, when, when, when life is harder uh, than, than we can fix it ourselves, when, when we are going through times when we are at our weakest, we pray prayers of utter dependence upon God and submission to God. We, we pray prayers, uh, I call them, I give up prayers. In other words, we come to the end of our rope and we say, I can't fix this and I need to totally rely upon God. And we pray a prayer of, of, of surrender. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And three times he goes to his heavenly Father. He's praying 
and, and he's asking his heavenly father to remove the cup of suffering that is before him, the cross. And three times Jesus comes away and the father says, you need to go to the cross. And Jesus ends up that prayer with your will be done. That's a, that's a prayer of surrender. That's a prayer that we ought to pray, a heartfelt prayer. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, or, or actually Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. This is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is as it is in heaven. Anybody who is a follower of Jesus Christ will pray this prayer several times in their lives. A prayer of surrender. A second kind, uh, kind of prayer that we find in the Bible, a heartfelt prayer, is prayers of worship. Prayers of worship. When you go through the book of Psalms, what you will see is over and over you will find the psalmist worshiping God. This morning, just minutes ago, we were led in worship. And during that time, whether you knew it or not, we were praying prayers through song to God. We ought to be praying those prayers. A third kind of prayer that we should, that we should pray is prayers of thanksgiving. I think that some of the prayers that will ultimately totally change your life are prayers of thanksgiving. When we stop for a moment for asking things from God and rather start thanking God for the things that he's already given to us. When I was uh, back in 1980 and as in the process of coming to Christ, I found this prayer. It's called the Prayer of the Unknown Confederate Soldier. And, and I remember praying this prayer and and. and just really impacted uh, my life. I asked for strength that I might achieve, and I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel my need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for but everything that I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. Isn't that an awesome prayer? That's, that's, that's the prayer of a man who didn't get what he asked for, but got more than he asked for. That's a, that's a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, another type of prayer that we should pray is uh, prayers of confession and repentance. You know, every day, every one of us has the opportunity to pray these prayers. Amen? Because every day we, we stumble and we fall. Every day we sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, every day, each and every one of us should be coming before God and praying heartfelt prayers of confession. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that one of the first verses that you ever learned as a new believer? Every day we should be coming before God and praying heartfelt prayers of confession. Prayers of supplication. Prayers of su what does that mean? Those are prayers where we come before God and we lay our requests before God. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it, it says that... Um, uh, we are told to cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. And so when we're praying prayers of supplication, we come to God uh, with, our, with our hearts and we just lay before him our needs. And it says there that he, that he listens to us because he cares for us. 
Another kind of prayer that we ought to pray are, are prayers of intercession. And, and these are prayers where we pray for the needs of others. And we just did that a few min- minutes ago. You know, we took up prayer request. And then what we did is we prayed for other people. And um, the last kind of prayer that I, I want to point out would be prayers of agreement, which are also known as corporate prayer, which we just did. And, and these are called amen prayers. You know, when Darren was up here praying, many of us were saying amen. We're in agreement with that prayer. So Jesus, when he says here, when you pray, uh, well, well, when should we pray? We should be praying all the time. God wants us to be in heartfelt communication with him all the time. Paul wrote, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. We're, we're to pray when life's filled with challenges. We're to pray when life is filled with blessings. We're to pray when our life is marred by, by spiritual failure. We're to pray when we have needs. We're to pray for other people. We're to pray corporate prayers when we're gathered together. And why do we do that? Because our Heavenly Father wants us to communicate with Him. The parody of prayer. The parody of prayer. Uh, parody means a, a, an imitation of prayer. Pr- parody means it's, it's not a reality. And, and we see in this passage how not to pray. Or why not to pray. We're not to pray like the hypocrites. And we're not to pray for the reason that the hypocrites pray when they, they pray to be seen by men. Jesus is simply saying to us, you know, don't be hypocritical in your prayer. Be sincere. You know, talk to me um, from the depths of your heart. Be sincere, sincere about what's going on in your heart. He says in, in this passage, do not be like the hypocrites. And, and I showed you this picture last week. Um, a hypocrite comes from a Greek word that Jesus is using there. Uh, means uh, a play actor, somebody who, who acts in a play. And so they play a part that they're really not. Uh, back in those days, they, uh, they didn't have women actors. They only had men actors. And so if in your play you had a, a woman, well, then a man would wear a woman mask. And at sometimes he would put on this happy mask. And at other times he'd put on this sad mask as he played the part of a woman. And Jesus is telling them, don't be like the hypocrites. And then what does he say about the hypocrites? Well, he says that they like to stand on the street corners. They like to pray pray in the synagogue so that everyone would see them and reward them. And uh, we did this last week. We're going to do it again. I'm going to ask all of you guys to clap with me for just a moment. Will you do that? Let's do it again. And so that is the reward you get when you pray in front of others to be seen by men. That is a very temporary, earthly reward. Jesus says that that he wants us to pray in such a way that we get an eternal reward for our prayers. So let me just tell you a little bit about the Jews. The Jews had a very high regard for prayer. They they said great prayer, um, greatest prayer, greater than all good works. In other words, if you were a really good prayer and and maybe not such a good doer, they said, well, that's, that's good that you're such a good prayer. But the problem with the Jews is that they had a great knack for taking something that was good and then twisting it into something bad. And that's what the Pharisees had done. They had taken this good thing called prayer and they twisted it and turned it into something that would draw attention to themselves. How did they do that? Well, one of the ways they did this is their their prayers became ritualized. Uh, They didn't have spontaneous prayers that came from their heart. Uh, Rather, what they would have would be written down prayers that you would read at specific times of the day or in specific times of the worship service. And so we're, we're, we're not like that. We're a Bible church, and so a lot of what we do is spontaneous. But back in many churches today, you get your liturgy 
from your sitting. So in other words, you get a script that you're going to follow on a Sunday morning. You're going to read this passage, and here's the homily, or at least an outline for the homily, and these are the prayers that you're going to pray. And so on Sunday morning, you come, you come and you open up your script for the day, and you read through it. But the problem is, if you do that, you do it without heart. One of the problems was that their prayers had become ritualized. For example, they have this thing, it's called the Shema. The Shema comes from a Hebrew word, which means to hear. And the Shema is basically taken out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then what they would do is they would quote a part of Deuteronomy chapter 6. They would quote a part of Deuteronomy chapter 11. And then what they would do is quote a part out of Numbers chapter 15. And so every day in the morning they had these passages written down. And they had to pray this prayer before the sun came up. And then they would have to pray this prayer before the sun went down. And so it was very, very well scripted. But can you imagine what happened over a period of time if every day you're praying the very same prayer in the morning and in the evening? And after a period of time, that prayer would probably have very little meaning. Isn't that true? They become very ritualized. When I was in Ghana as a missionary, um, the Muslims would have a call to prayer. And uh, there was a mosque in the community in which I was in. And uh, every day, you know, at specific times of the day, you would hear this call of worship. And all the Muslims would stop whatever they were doing and they would pray. That's kind of like what the Jewish people were doing. They had specific times of the day where they would stop whatever they were doing and they would pray. But one of the problems with that is the hypocrites, the spiritual leaders, what they would try to do is they would time those specific times of the day to be in a prominent place where everyone could see them pray. They wanted everybody to see them pray. Another fault that they had in their prayer is that they, they believed the longer the prayer, the better. And so some of them would pray for a long time. And another problem that they had, and it's mentioned in our scripture here today, when they pray, they, they, they keep on babbling like pagans. So in other words, they, they believed in what we would call vain repetition. They would pray the same thing over and over and over again. And that was a problem with their prayers. But then the worst fault, when you look at our passage, was the fact that they would do it to be seen by men. Their motives were wrong in their prayer. The next thing I want to show you is the place of prayer. The place of prayer. The hypocrites love to play in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen. But where should we pray? Jesus tells us in this passage, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What Jesus was telling them was basically don't do anything that those guys are doing. Exactly do the opposite. When you pray, you go someplace where nobody can see you so that your prayer won't be tainted by, by any pretense and where you can just talk with God. Do you have a place where you like to pray? Do you have a place where you can go alone and pray? In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says of Jesus that uh, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up 
And he left the house and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So that that was his habit, to get alone with God the Father. But we also find when we look at Jesus' life, that in Matthew chapter 4, he went into the wilderness. And while he was in the wilderness, there was a time when he was being tempted by Satan. And um, Jesus prayed there. He prayed in the wilderness. We, we find in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus fed the 5,000, that when he fed the 5,000, in front of the 5,000, he, he took the five loaves and the two, two fish. And what did he do? He, he broke it and he gave thanks. So in other words, Jesus was praying in public. Well, why was he praying in public? Was he was giving thanks to his father who wasn't praying to be seen. We, we find that um, Jesus... Um, prayed a, a prayer of thanksgiving at the Last Supper. We find that Jesus prayed a prayer of submission in the Garden of Gethsemane. We find that Jesus prayed a prayer of forgiveness when he was on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So Jesus did pray in public, but he prayed with the right motives. He, he, here's some, something we, we need to know. If our heart is in the right place, every place is the right place to pray. If our heart is in the right place, every place is the right place to pray. So in other words, when we get up in the morning and we get out of bed, we ought to say rather than, good Lord, it's morning, we ought to say, good morning, Lord. And then when, we, when, we're, when we're, you know, showering and shaving and getting ready for the day, that, 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 that can be a place of prayer. Uh, when, when you get into your car and you're going to work, that can be a place of prayer. When you get to work and you're dealing with uh, difficult people, that can be a place of prayer. When you're coming home from work, when, when, you're, when you're on the ball field or on the soccer field or in the classroom, you know, God delights to hear our prayers wherever we are. Every place can be a place of prayer if our hearts are in the right place. The place of prayer. Let's look at the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer. Well, the purpose is to talk to your Heavenly Father. That's why we pray. Our, our oldest son, Zach, is in the Air Force. He's stationed in England. And uh, he called us from England this last Sunday. He calls us. We can't call him because uh, we never know when he's available. And I kind of chided him. I said, you know, Zach, it's been three weeks since you've called. He goes, no, it hasn't. It's only been two weeks. I said, Zach, it's been three weeks since you called. And um, the reason that I chided him is because I love him and I want to hear from him. I want to know what's going on in his life. Um, I don't want any other airmen calling me from England I don't know them they're not my kid but I want Zach to call me because I love him and I want to know how to pray for him and I want to provide for him it says in Ephesians chapter 1 in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons in accordance with his pleasure and his will. The moment that you became a Christian, you became a child of God. And your heavenly Father wants to hear what's going on in your life. That's the purpose for prayer. There are three answers that God gives to our request. The three answers are yes and no and wait. He answers yes when our, when our prayers are in alignment with his will. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says this, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And so when we're asking for something that is in accordance with his will, God says yes. And then when we're asking for something that is not in accordance with his will, God says no. Well, why does he do that? Because he loves us. 
and he only wants to give to us what is best. And then there's other times where God says, wait. And the reason that he says, wait, is because you aren't ready for the answer of yes yet. There, there's something that needs to happen in your life. Maybe you're not spiritually mature enough for, that, for the yes answer. Maybe you're not physically there. Maybe you're not the right age yet. But there are times where God says, wait. And he does that because he loves us. And he wants what's best for us. How many of you that are older today can remember some of the things that you prayed when you were young? And you're thanking God today that he said no. <laughs> do you have any of those? More than likely you do. Let, let's talk about the, the power of prayer. The power of prayer. So God urges us to pay, pray even though he already knows what we need. So then why pray? Why, 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 why should we commune with our Heavenly Father uh, when he already knows what we need? In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says this. It says, A prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, uh, even as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Do we really know how powerful prayer is? I imagine that if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you could tell some tremendous stories of the things that God has done and how he has powerfully answered your prayer. So let, let me begin to wrap this up. There's the mystery of prayer. Some, some things about prayer we'll never understand, but yet we're all commanded to pray. There, there's the priority of prayer. We're, we're to pray without ceasing because there's always something to pray for. The parody of prayer. You know, God is, is, is telling us not to pray for hypocritical reasons, for wrong motivations. And, and, and the place of prayer. You can pray to God anywhere. If your heart is right, you can pray anywhere. Purpose of prayer is to talk to your Heavenly Father, and the power of prayer is this. You know, if you're a lifelong, fully devoted follower of Jesus, you've seen God answered prayer. And, and, and since he's answered your prayer in the past, you know he'll answer your prayer again in the future. I was, you know, thinking about our journey down to New Glarus Bible Church, and, and I know that that journey for us was empowered by our prayers and by yours. You know, God was involved in, in that prayer. And God's involved in your prayers today. And he wants to hear you pray. Why? Because you're, you're a heavenly father. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you that, um, that you desire to commune with us. We thank you that you've adopted us as your sons and your daughters, that you've drawn us into a relationship with yourself we thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives and the work that you're doing around us and we thank you that you answer our prayers and therefore lord we will continue to pray lord i pray for anybody here today that doesn't know jesus christ as his lord and his savior i pray that that you would um lord that you would draw them um, into a relationship with yourself because of your kindness or that you would lead them to repentance. Lord, I pray that today, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, that today they would place your faith in your sinless, perfect life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. And Lord, I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Yeah.